Well, in the past, we've um, only been able to cover four or five verses uh, each night, but um, we're starting Second Peter uh, chapter 1, the second book of Peter tonight, and maybe it will go along a little faster. One thing, we don't want to get too stuck in the weeds or too stuck in minor details that it becomes uninteresting. So we want it to move along fast enough and yet slow enough that we can take time to understand it. I'd like to share a couple of thoughts um, about the second epistle of Peter. Um, it was interesting to me to learn that in the early years of the, of the uh, history of the Christian church, the second book of Peter was not included in the Bible. In hmm. fact, many of the church leaders believed it didn't belong in the Bible. They, they didn't even think Peter wrote it. They thought somebody else wrote it. Or if Peter did write it, that it was not on the same level as the first letter of Peter. Um, but it persisted to be printed or, or copied and, and studied along with the other books of the Bible. And so um, um, listen to this uh, interesting thought um, of Peter. This is, this is from the Bible commentaries. It says of Peter, one epistle uh, that which is called uh, his first is admitted and the ancient uh, presbyters use this in their own writings as unquestioned but, they, but the so-called second epistle we have not received as canonical. But nevertheless, it has appeared useful to many of us and has been studied with the other scriptures. So they kept it because it was beneficial and people studied it and were blessed from their study. So they kept it. They let it survive. Uh, it's interesting that there are no quotations from Second Peter anywhere in the Christian writings of the first 300 years of the Christian church. Uh, no references to it at all. Uh, it is believed that uh, Second Peter was written by Peter when he was in Rome and probably just a year or in a year and a half before his execution. So it was, um, it was probably written in AD 66, maybe AD 65, and he was martyred in AD 67. So he sensed as he was writing this, he sensed that his time was coming to an end. Um, the theme is interesting. What is, what is the second book of Peter about? And it's good for us to know this at the beginning as we get into reading it so that it has more meaning, so it fits together. Um, there are only three chapters, and uh, the theme of the first chapter is pastoral. Peter is taking the role of a pastor. He's encouraging He's cajoling, he's instructing, he's leading his church, uh, the church in Asia Minor. And, um, and um, he emphasizes grace and spiritual knowledge. Well, now, I have a question for you. What's the difference between grace and spiritual knowledge? Anybody want to tackle that? He emphasizes those two things in the first chapter what what are those two topics what do they mean what's grace what's spiritual knowledge grace is uh, the holy spirit god's holy spirit power to that indwells in us to to do the things he asks so he gives us this grace to accomplish his will oh that's powerful Thank you for sharing that. And what spiritual knowledge? I would say spiritual knowledge is, is like what we're doing based on our study in the word and getting to know God's word. 
So I think that's part of it. Well, I'll uh, don't let me offend you, uh, Michael. But <laughs> no, <it's> okay. <laughs> we could call that just knowledge, just knowledge. Um, but he's okay. referring to it as spiritual knowledge. What's the difference between knowledge <laughs> I, and spiritual I, knowledge? May I say something? Yes, please. Uh, good, good evening, everybody. This is James. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, not to not to make any uh, waves here, but grace is like an unmerited favor that we receive from God. It's yes. undeserving. Yes. And a, def a definition. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's many definitions for that. Uh, but the spiritual knowledge is, for me, is learning to, uh, to you know, to battle uh, in the spiritual realm uh, against, you know, these uh, negative uh, spiritual influences that we struggle with, you know. And knowledge is, is just skills we learn, I think, as far as praying and fellowshipping and learning the Word of God. Um, one that comes to mind for me today, and I was hearing this earlier on the radio, some, some of us we sometimes forget is, uh, you know, uh, do we, uh, you know, for the, the tools of spiritual battle or, or, or uh, the helmet of salvation, uh, the shield of faith, uh, breastplate of righteousness, uh, the belt of truth, sword of the spirit and, and the shoes of peace. And, um, you know, that's for me, you know, uh, again, not to, not to make any ways for anybody else and their definitions, but for me, that's, that's where it's at is how am I going to make it through this life and so, uh, make it through my spiritual battles without being overcome, you know? So I totally agree we, we with you. It, oh, thank you, Pastor. Go go ahead and finish, please, Steve. Oh, oh I was just going to say, oh, uh, gonna... We, we're not going to come through this battle unscathed. I mean, we're going to have our our, war, our, our, our scars and, and whatnot. Uh, but for me, it's about uh, you know finishing the race the way Paul the uh, Apostle Paul talks about. You know, okay. I want to finish my race. Excellent. So, um, Michael, you'll get a turn just a minute here. I want to process what Steve. No, no, go ahead. Um, so. It's it's spiritual knowledge is is knowledge of God's word knowledge of God uh, spiritual has to do with spiritual warfare and it's an experience what you described Steve is an experience it's more than just knowing information it's an experience and um, grace is exactly what you said it's unmerited favor it's it's god's undeserved blessings in our life yes, that's grace yes, sir. yes and, and michael it's james it's, it's james pastor did i, mean, I say okay, steve I, my my apologies ahead, okay. i had steve I on my no mind <laughs> my apologies no, no no worries okay thanks michael so um yeah. Uh, Michael, uh, thank you, James, for what you shared. Michael, yes, what sir. is your comment? Now, I was saying that I basically what you guys say that I, I, I guess I, I humble myself, and <laughs> your definition is better. Your guys' definition is better than mine. So, so that spiritual have to do, I would say, yeah, with the walking and so forth, and not just knowledge. <laughs> Yeah, and don't you know that Peter had an experience with God and an experience with truth, especially yes, he as is. he approached his martyrdom? Well, yes. chapter one is also about um, um, the prophetic word, and um, and Peter mentions prophecy and the prophetic word. Chapter two. Uh, he warns against false teachers. And chapter three is a discussion of the scoffers' rejection of the promise of Christ's return. Um, he deals with those who are starting to doubt that Jesus is coming again. And he affirms the certainty of the second coming. So those are the things we'll encounter as we study. Who would like to read verse one? Somebody, a volunteer, pick it up with verse 1 of Second Peter chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a bit in this little verse. Um, so we know his name. We know the writer. It's Simon Peter. It's, it's interesting. There shouldn't be any doubt about who wrote it because he uses both of his exactly. names. Exactly. You know? Um, and um, it's interesting that he identifies himself as a servant and an apostle. Do you, mm -hmm. Tom and Barry, do you know what the word apostle means? Messenger. We were talking mm. a couple Sabbaths ago about Ellen White not claiming, uh, not saying that she was a prophet, but saying that she was a messenger. And here Peter is doing the same thing. He says, I'm an apostle, a messenger. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that we put Ellen White on the same level as Peter, um, because, you know, one is in the Bible and the other is not. But uh, uh, it's interesting that the same word is used regarding both. For Peter and Ellen White, they're both referred to as a messenger. Um, any comment? <laughs> Um, hello. Hi, Pastor. Um, I have a short thing here. It's not too lot. Um, it's like a, I have a New King James Version, and I think they have a really good summary of Second Peter. If I could read it, I'll try to read it quickly. It's kind of... Um, okay, it's, it says, First Peter deal with problem from the outside. Second Peter deal with problem from the inside. Peter writes to warn the believers about the false teachers who are peddling damaging doctrine. He begins by urging them to keep close watch on their personal lives. The Christian life demands diligence in pursuing moral excellence, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and selfless love. By contrast, the false teachers are sensual, arrogant, greedy and covetous. They scoff at the thought of future judgment and live their life as if the present would be the pattern for the future. And almost then, Peter reminds them that although God may be long suffering in sending judgment, ultimately it will come. In view of that fact, believers should live lives of godliness, aimlessness and steadfastness. I thought I really like it when I read it. It's a summary they gave of Second Peter in the Bible. That's excellent. I'm glad you shared mm -hmm. that. That's really Thank very you. good. Thank you. Um, and so um, in verse 1, um, it says... Um, that Simon is writing to them that have obtained like precious face, faith with, uh, with us. So he's writing to those who share the Christian faith. And it says in the commentary, presumably, presumably, they are the same believers to whom he addressed the first epistle, the first book. And so now they're older they're more mature as Christians, and um, uh, he's identifying with them, writing to them, uh, people that know him, and they, they know his writings. Um, and um, I, I picked up on the phrase, the righteousness of God, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's very interesting that it says through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Is he referring to two different people? Some people say that he's referring to God the Father and Jesus Christ the Savior here. But actually, that, that would cause a potential problem. Um, is Christ only our Savior, or is he also God? Uh, if we separate the two into two different people, God the Father and God the Son, it almost sounds as though 
the Father is God and Jesus <laughs> is not God. But listen to this. This is how one word can be so powerful. I want you to watch this. Where it says, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, the word and in Greek can be translated even. So let's read it using the word even. Through the righteousness of God even our Savior, Jesus Christ. That makes it one person. That means Jesus yeah. is God. And God yeah. is Jesus. And we don't lose his, his divinity. Isn't that interesting how that one little word can be translated and or even? And if it's even here, it makes such a big difference. By the word, by the way, the word is... Uh, Kai, K-A-I in Greek, and it also can mean also. So it's and, also, or even. But uh, what a difference that makes. Any comments on that? Isn't that interesting? Yeah, this is good. This is, okay, um, Galen? I was just going to say, and can be inclusive. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's a good no, this point. Is that yeah, I like the point. I like the point you made there. That that's interesting. And you said it was and and even. Okay, one of those two. In Revelation chapter one, it, it uses this, it uses this the and God and it's also uses God and Jesus Christ in there. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him. So I think in that in that case, that's the Father giving unto Jesus Christ the Son. Yeah, it it doesn't. It doesn't insinuate that they're the same person. In fact, it's rather clear that there are two different persons in that passage. In that right. passage, yeah. Okay. I heard someone else. Uh, any other comment? Okay. Um, I just had a quick question. Yes. So, where it says Simon Peter, a bond servant, um, is that? Is he saying that because he's in Rome and he's um, yes. incarcerated? Yes. Because in First he's... Peter, in First Peter, he only says "apostle of Jesus Christ." Um, however, he... in Second Peter, he says "bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ." You're absolutely right. That's very observant, and I'm glad you shared that. He was a prisoner in Rome when writing the second. Um, and he may not have been when he wrote the first. Pastor. Some think he may have been in Rome at the time of the first, but um, definitely that's what it means. He's, he's incarcerated for his faith. Galen? My King James only says Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Not oh, that's interesting. That's King interesting. James. Um, it, I do want to read this one comment from the commentary about um, understanding verse one to refer to um, God, even our savior, Jesus Christ, the same person, God and Jesus being the same person. Listen to this, such a clear acceptance of the deity of Jesus need cause no surprise for Peter himself had acknowledged his Lord as the son of the living God. And Peter was there and heard Thomas call him my Lord and my God. Mm -hmm. Isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. That's biblical evidence that it's talking about one and the same Jesus in verse one. Let's go to verse two. Is there a, a volunteer to read verse two? Grace and peace be yours in abundance to the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Okay, thank you, Todd. So we've already heard what grace is. Uh, someone defined it as unmerited favor, um, the favor of God, undeserved. Um, and um, it, I like the word uh, that you used in your translation, uh, Tots. Um, abundant, abundant grace, uh, grace and peace, abundant. 
uh, in the uh, King James, it says multiplied, grace and peace mm -hmm. multiplied. So I like both words. Um, Pastor, can I, yes. can I tell you my, my definition of the difference between mercy and grace? Yes, please. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. And grace is giving us what we don't deserve. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's excellent. Folks, you ought to write that down in the, uh, at, at the uh, end, end pages of your Bible. That's a good one. You want to repeat it one more time, Galen? Sure. Second. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. Amen. Gillen, might you provide a reference if you're, you know, if you, if, where, where did you see that? I don't know. I've had it in the front of my Bible for years. I don't know where it came from. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I like it. Thank you. Read the last yeah, half so of it. Grace is what? Grace is giving us what we don't deserve. And when God has mercy, he's not giving us what we deserve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we'll Thank have you. to find where that comes from. That's great. <laughs> kind of bug work. What, yeah. what was that, um, mm -hmm. Carolyn? What oh, I'm just saying I'd like to Google that to find out who the author is of that. Yeah, that, that would be good. If you find it, share mm -hmm. it with us, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I want to mention this regarding multiplied or abundant. The readers that uh, Peter is writing to in 2 Peter already possessed grace and peace in some measure, but now the apostle wants to have them gain even greater supplies of grace and peace. Do you know grace and peace in your life? Would you like more? Would you like to know more grace and peace in your life? That's what Peter Amen. that's what Peter wants for us in writing this this book. Uh, let's let's go to um, uh, another comment here uh, through the knowledge. In verse two it says through the knowledge. Um, the word here used knowledge is not the normal word for knowledge. The normal Greek word for knowledge is gnosis. But the word used here is epigenosis. It is more emphatic than the simple noun form of knowledge. Epigenosis implies a further, a fuller, more perfect knowledge that comes from contemplation of the object studied such knowledge cannot fail to influence the life of the one who gains it when it centers on the father and the son it brings abundant grace and peace into the heart of its possessor the apostle is very much aware of the e efficacy of this epigenosis this super knowledge and refers to it four times in this little book of Second Peter. Isn't that interesting? It's knowledge, but it's more than knowledge. It's, um, it's more emphatic. It comes from contemplation of the object. Ha have you been contemplating Jesus lately? That's epigenosis. That's knowing him. That's knowing him in a personal, intimate way. Through prayer, through prayer and Bible study, we contemplate him and know him. Any comments there? Well, yeah, isn't there, isn't one of the pagan deities, it, Moloch, wasn't he a god of, a, a, a lowercase god of knowledge or something like that? Okay, yes. And so no, knowing, like, you just whatever i mean worshiping knowledge or whatever but knowing actually knowing jesus like um the ability to, to know him like i know that person right like someone might know like we have friends that we know right 
Is yes. that the knowledge you're talking about? Or it's it's experiential. It's relational. It's um, you know you can know a lot of things. You can know a lot of subjects, a lot of information. You can even know a lot of information about the Bible and about God. But this is talking about knowledge from knowing Him personally. Barry, do you have any comments on this? Um. He's, he's not here right now. Oh, okay. He had some allergy uh, issues, okay. so he'll, he'll be coming back. All right. Did you want to comment on this, kind of... Carolyn? No? Okay. No, actually, I'm looking up the quotes because I want to okay. find out where it's <laughs> Galen, did you have a comment? Yes. Who was it that was about to speak? Was that you, Galen? Yeah, yeah. So, Michael, I was just going to say that um, as as you speak of about this knowledge and you kind of emphasize it and everything, it makes me think of of, of like Enoch, how you know walking with God to know yes. Him so good that you know. So I thought of that that Enoch really got into that knowledge of God and so much that God say, "Hey, you know enough, you could come and live with me now," you know. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, an excellent, excellent example. And that's why we have the marriage as an example, too. The bridegroom yes. and the bride. Intimate yes. knowledge. Yes. It's, it's knowledge, good. but it's an intimate personal experience as well. It's both. All right, so let's go to verse 3. A volunteer, please, to read verse 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. All right. All right. At the beginning, it refers to divine power. Divine power. It's that's fascinating. I, I was interested in that phrase. And there's this comment in the commentary. It says, Peter is here stressing the might and majesty of his Lord, as he does elsewhere in the epistle. And he shows what his Lord's power can do for us. That divine power, folks can transform your life and my life. That divine power can change us and guide us through life and can bless us with his own presence in our life. That's the divine power. Is that the same power that, that the people will say, like the evangelists, or some people sometimes say the dynamos or something, the... Um, the power of God unto salvation, is that the same word? Um, yes, it is. It is. And it and in the Greek it's dynamos. Yes. And okay, it, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um did you find that quote, Carolyn? No, I just see a lot of speakers and writers that that quote that, but they don't give the original source. So it's it's very commonly used in marriage seminars and um, in books that have been written, but I can't find the original um, author of that. Mm, okay, so in yeah. verse three, there's another interesting thought, a very key thought. Do you think God has held anything back from us? Do you think there's anything that God has at his disposal that he has not shared with us? It says here, he has given all things to us. Um, mm -hmm. It's a reminder that the Lord has mm -hmm. withheld no necessary aid mm -hmm. to our salvation. Mm -hmm. That is powerful. Mm -hmm. He has withheld no necessary aid to our salvation. Um, godliness. It mentions godliness mm -hmm. in verse 3. Mm -hmm. What is yeah. godliness? What 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 do you think? What do you understand godliness to be? I would say like the character of God. Um, mm. Mm. 
So that's only possible, I think, through God's divine creative power. Because we're not naturally that way. Um, and it's, it's good news for um, us that God can work into our hearts and, and lives, his character. Um, you know, I've seen bumper stickers that say, Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. And I think, I, I don't really like that. <laughs> you know, it just sounds like they have an excuse for uh, sinning or whatever. I don't know. But, um, uh, you know, I think hopefully Christians are reflecting Christ's character more and more, you know, as they walk with him in this life. <laughs> There you go. Okay, when <laughs> when you're not talking, people, can you mute, please? That's a good idea, Galen. I'll I'll take a I'll take a guess at what the godliness is. Just to educate a guess, is it God likeness? Is it? I something? like that. I like that. Image yes. of God. Mm -hmm. Yes, God likeness is godliness. Um, the gifts bestowed by Christ. Um, are to enable his followers to attain the standards set for them. The victorious life cannot be lived without the gifts. So it, so it behooves us to accept and to use those gifts that he gives us. And um, sorry, I was having trouble reading it. The edge of my page was cut off. So, um, God likeness, I like that. Mm -hmm. And um, God expects us to live by his standards. And, mm -hmm. um, and he bestows, he bestows his gifts upon us. He, he he tells us how to how to live and then gives us the power to do that to live mm -hmm. like he says amen that's amen. that's powerful that's powerful um and it appears that we the word we come up against again is knowledge he said through the knowledge so it is that intimate knowledge again that would give us the power and would give us the help us become godly amen okay mm -hmm. Um, I received a phone call yesterday. I was doing some paperwork here at home and the phone rang. I picked it up and it said, um, the guy said, um, uh, are you a pastor? I said, yes. He said, do you have anything to do with that radio program on KDAR, the Christian station? I said, yes. I said, we just started the program two days ago. He said, well, I heard it. And he said, I really like, he said, I really like that program and what the speaker is saying. He said, he said, you know, I don't like very many Christian radio programs because people get on their radio and talk about stuff that they don't do. They talk about the Bible, but they don't live the Bible. But he said, that man speaking on the Bible, I can tell he, he lives what he preaches. That's what people are looking for today. That's what people mm -hmm. want today. They want to see godliness. And Peter is admonishing us uh, that God not only expects godliness, but he's given it as a gift. He's given Amen. it as a gift. Uh, mm -hmm. what's, what do, what's the meaning of glory and virtue? At the end of verse 3, it refers to glory and virtue. Well, um, virtue. Virtue is, uh, uh, let's see, where did I write uh, a note about that? Um, oh, excellence. Yeah, goodness and excellence. Um I must need a new pair of glasses. I had circled the word excellence. Virtue oh, is excellence. But you don't need a but you don't need a new uh, microphone because no no good. is it working Thank good you. tonight? <laughs> you sounding good. Sounding good. Really, <laughs> you can 
Just, you can thank this new microphone. It's made all the difference in the world. Um, listen, listen to this quote about virtue or excellence. It says, the phrase under consideration may support the application to Christ of the words, him that hath called, since it is primarily Christ's own glory and excellence to which the striving Christian aspires. It is the sight of Christ lifted up on the cross that simulates men, that stimulates men to abandon sin and to follow after the glorious qualities the Savior so persuasively displays. When we see Christ lifted up, when the people of Israel in the wilderness saw the serpent on the cross lifted up, um, it, it represented Christ and it represented healing. And if we will behold Christ lifted up on the cross, he will draw all to him. It will stimulate us to abandon sin and to follow after the glorious qualities the Savior mm -hmm. so persuasively displays. I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, yeah. Webster, Webster's, Webster's first definition of virtue is general moral excellence. Oh, that's interesting. General moral mm -hmm. excellence. Specific moral quality regarded as good, chastity, yeah. excellence in general. Yeah. Well, do you uh, think do you think we lift up Christ enough in our church and in our world today? Is he lifted up on high enough? No. No. How do we lift him up? Well, we don't. He says if I be lifted up, yeah, it's, he's he lifted himself up if we let people know about his power over the grave and So how do we think? point attention to Christ well, lifted up? By not bringing attention to ourselves and putting oh, it, you know, that's powerful. Right? Are there other ideas? How do yeah. we lift Christ up? By living a virtuous life ourselves. That's it. That's I, it. I agree with Amen. with Carolyn that, that what she was saying. You know, it says um, that He can save to the uttermost, and and if we don't <laughs> believe that God can can. Uh, make us Christ-like, uh, it'll be too late when we finally find out that he can. Excellent, excellent. Any other thoughts on verse three? I just was yeah, curious. Yeah, just thinking. Okay, Wendy, Wendy first and then Michael. Yeah, can you hear yeah, me? Yep, yeah, yep, yeah. uh, yeah, go ahead. When, uh, you know, when the woman touches the hem of his garment and he says, I feel virtue has gone out of me. Oh. I don't. I've never really comprehended what he's what he's saying because obviously his goodness couldn't have gone out of him. But uh, maybe it's just kind of a vague term. Or do you know if it's the same? Uh, that it doesn't really fit in that situation, does no, it? No, not no, not by my understanding. But you no, know, it doesn't fit to say excellence went out from him. I've always understood that to mean that his power went out from him. His power to heal. His power mm -hmm. to save. That could mm -hmm. be. Yeah. The virtuous power. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Trying, trying to make one language say the same thing in another language is so challenging. And that's what we deal with, with the Bible. Yeah. Um, and that's why we need the Holy Spirit. That's one reason we need the Holy Spirit as we study. So let's have a I was gonna, Oh, yes, Michael. Michael's sorry. Next. Yeah, I was going to comment that there's a, there's a phrase that I've been hearing a lot lately called virtue, virtue signaling. And I was, um, anyone have a comment? Do we have to be, do we have to signal virtue also or just live virtue? Is there a difference between virtue and virtue signaling? Any thoughts on that? What, what is the, what did you I say, virtue know. signal? Yes, I've heard uh, some phrase 
people are talking in politics and saying, I guess when you when you want to say something, you know, you say something about you to to I guess it, like a like a person who is anti-abortion would say something, even though they may not be practicing. I'm not sure exactly, but they would say something that would kind of stir the ear of the listeners. Uh, for different theme and topic, but it's um, it's a phrase I've heard recently: virtue signaling. If anyone could comment about that, I've never heard it. I've never heard it either. <laughs> Very... Okay, this is what it says on Google. It says, "Virtue signaling is the action or practice of publicly expressing opinions or sentiments intended to demonstrate one's good character." <laughs> Or the moral oh. correctness of one's position on a particular issue. Okay, so that's yeah. This is kind of what I I thought. I've heard this in the context of of more conservative talk show hosts and whatnot talking about virtue signaling of people mm -hmm. on the politically on the left. That's what specifically what I yeah I think the context oh, okay. where they're talking about things and you know trying to set this this kingdom of righteousness up. Um, by everybody, um, by claiming what everyone else should be doing, and you right. know how how they should be not racist and so on and so forth, and mm -hmm. this and that. I think it's something like this. Yeah, it's it goes along with the. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that's what I've heard. Yeah. All right, let's go um, to verse four, and we need a volunteer to read verse four, please. That's such a beautiful verse. Go ahead and read it, Carolyn. Oh, it's, I just love it. Okay. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. I guess that was Ellen White's and John Wesley's favorite verse. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, I wrote it in my Bible. Bible. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So you're in good company there. We lost our, our pastor. <laughs> did, you hear him, did you hear him driving away in the car? Yeah, that was yeah. him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a noisy car. <laughs> he was making his break here. <laughs> Coming back in. <laughs> well, we had our heads down there. <laughs> That's really quite a verse that says that we can be partakers. I know mm -hmm. of the divine nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's uh, yeah. that's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And all the promises. Mm -hmm. I know Ellen White always says, "Well, in the last days, we'll just live off those promises that we should mm -hmm. commit them to memory." Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. The Tyndale version says to give us his own character. Mm. Ah, that's good. Mm. And character yes. is yourself. Mm. You're giving us what he has. Mm. And and it You're says in, Pastor. Ellen White says uh, Now's the time we need to develop our characters. That fits right in there. Yeah, it does. Okay, so the pastor's back, I believe, correct? I don't see him. I don't either. <laughs> yeah, I um, I have no idea what happened. My computer was still on, but I couldn't hear you. And <laughs> I guess you couldn't hear me. Um, we, we can hear you, but we can't see you. <laughs> yeah, now you can. Um, so why don't we have a season of prayer to wrap up, okay? Right. Um, who would like to lead us in prayer, maybe mentioning some of the things we've studied tonight, precious words of God?
what? Father, we um, we have uh, hit a gold mine, Lord, just in these first few verses. Mm -hmm. Some very deep thoughts about you and about Jesus and about your nature. And Lord, we um, we know that we need to know you better. Amen. And we need to have a closer walk with you. Yes. And Lord, I um, I just pray that uh, for each one of us that you will give us an ever deepening hunger uh-huh. for finding out who Jesus is and what He means to us. Oh Lord, we uh, have so much trouble, as the Jews of old did, of recognizing the Messiah. Oh Lord, we we have just scraped the the edges, Lord, the surface of what Jesus is, who he is, and what he means to us. And we just ask that the Holy Spirit will guide each one of us into a deeper relationship with him. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Dear Lord, i just like to thank you for your servant, Peter, who, while he was imprisoned, wrote these um, verses that are so powerful and relevant to us um, down in our time, Lord. We certainly have um, a, a world of, of suffering and, and sin, and so we are thankful that we can rely on your power to give us life and godliness through your exceedingly great and precious promises so that we could reflect your your light, Lord, at this time in in our lives. So thank you, Lord, so much for this these beautiful verses. Amen. 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 Dear Lord, it's, I've just, it's just come to my mind that Paul, Peter, and John the Revelator were all in dire straits when they mm-hmm. wrote these things. And they were really having trouble physically. Mm-hmm. But Lord, that's the time when maybe we can reach you more. So Lord, we ask you to be with us through the through the valleys, not just on the mountaintops. You will you will lead us through the valleys, Lord, that uh, when times are hard, we can depend on you and your divine nature and your promises, Lord. Thank you so much when we, we dedicate ourselves to you, even tonight. In Jesus Amen. 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 Oh, Father in heaven, how much we love you, how much we love your word. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the encouragement you give us through the words of Scripture. And um, Lord, uh, in these times in which we live, we need a closer relationship with you and help us to spend more time with your word, getting to know you and understanding your messages to us. Oh, Father, give us the Holy Spirit to experience transformation in our life. Give us the Holy Spirit to make us more like Jesus so that when people get to know us, they will think differently than the bumper stickers that advertise forgiveness. Uh, We understand we'll always need a forgiving God. But, oh God, please make us new through the power of your spirit and make us into a living testament to those around us. Lord, I pray your blessing on everyone in this group tonight. Give a special double portion of your blessing on each one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 
Amen. So I, I'd encourage each of you to have uh, the wonderful experience that I had tonight. I, I got online 10 minutes early. So if you get online next week, uh, five or 10 minutes early, uh, we can start right at seven o'clock. Uh, that would be a great goal, don't you think? Yep. <laughs> All right. Have a good week, folks. God bless. Bye, Galen. God bless. Bye. 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 Bye.